Okay, welcome to today's episode of Raising the Bar with myself, John Cooper. I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Michael Sarion. Michael is an author, researcher and public speaker and someone that I've followed and admired for a long while. And he's amassed an enormous body of work that looks into male and female psychology, astrotheology, ancient civilization, Western magic traditions, and much, much more. His website is michaelsarian.com, and we're going to be talking about one of his latest books, Dragon Mother, A New Look at the Female Psyche. Michael, welcome to the show. Uh, John, it's great, man. Uh, tickled to be on. Uh, I've been you know, looking forward to this conversation, so thanks for the invitation, mate. Yeah, thanks, mate. Uh, you know, I thought we could dive straight into it, and I thought, well, a better place to start than would be the womb, <laughs> where we all start, which is actually the basis of your book. And you talk about this in terms of the dragon mother. So this relates to the effect of the mother's relationship with us in childhood and during the prenatal periods. Now, contrary to what people may think by hearing that term, it's not a pejorative, and it simply means the containment or encirclement of the child within the womb, much like the circle motif of the serpent eating its own tail that we see pop up um, throughout history. You then go on to talk about the core thesis within the book, which is actually the terrible mother, which is in Jungian terms connected to the devouring mother. Michael, would you mind clarifying all this for the audience and just laying the brief foundations for the show, I guess paraphrasing the book and its core themes? Oh, yes, be glad to. Um, I've unpacked it really in Dragon Mother and also in Adultism, the follow up. But the, yes, exactly where you're starting is from a Freudian perspective, it becomes easier, easier to understand. And that is that Freud thought that child development, psychological development began, you know, around two, actually. And it, uh, that that finally was contradicted by later people. His own secretary, Otto Rank, just said, no, no, something's wrong here. It's not that Freud really missed it, but one had to fill in the blanks that before two years of age, you know, there's a whole life being lived by a fetus, you know, and we still find this a little bit, you know, tricky to, to really grasp. But what they were saying was that uh, uh, Otto Rank, you know, basically said, look, let's take it right back to the moment of conception. Those nine months in a womb, you know, are, 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 are a whole lifetime, timeless uh, lifetime, you know, being lived. And then he, he was the first one to sort of write that. He wrote a book called The Tragedy of Birth, where he laid out these ideas. And it, co it caused, a, you know, a shitstorm. He basically fell out with Freud over it. Freud was just so, you know, not into it. So Rank had to then basically form his own independent sort of, you know, he became an independent psychologist. And it caused a major trauma in his life, you know, just in the same way that when Jung broke from Freud, it caused a major meltdown in his psychic life and all of that. Mm -hmm. And so this... The sort of uh, subject matter just lay there until a Jungian by the name of Erich, Erich Newman, you know, came along and picked up the subject with his own slant. Instead of a Freudian slant, it was now more of a Jungian slant. It's absolutely fascinating. But the problem was Erich Fromm died, but not Erich Fromm, Erich Newman died before his book on this subject could really come together. So there is a sort of a disheveled, unedited book out there called The Child, which I've had in my collection for years, wanted to do something on it, you know, and, and so the, finally the time came. And, yeah, it's just that he's basically saying the same thing, except he dissects it more. He, he, he gets into the anatomy of what happens in a child's consciousness. Now, the weird thing about that, why it's not a dead subject, is because the latest kind of pediatrics and the late, latest kind of neuronal, you know, instrumentation that actually shows what's happening in the womb to an actual infant corroborates right all of this activity hmm. you know uh, and so it's not just that the heart is beating and that the cells are developing and that the neurons are going this way and that in a, in a newborn child it's way more than that there's a whole dialogue going on between the mother's body and the child so this is not a conscious thing where the mother's super you know is uh, surveilling it or consciously intending it or even aware of it some women who are sensitive are aware of it but this is way below the threshold of normal awareness so it's a, what I call a conversation that's taken place. And this is just with the mother, not the terrible mother. If you get to the terrible mother, you know, we, it changes a bit. But that's just in general what it is. There's a conversation bioenergetically between fetus and, and the body. So let's put it that way, the somatic intelligence of the mother. And, and you actually talk about the terrible mother being the, the sort of the intervention, the sort of the, the blocking out from the, the natural connection the fetus has with, I think you refer to it as the, the matrix, the sort of the, the, the goddess or the, just the connection to, to the universe, you know, the universal energy. And in effect, that is the denying of the child. It's, it's autonomy at a very early stage, right? 
That's right. This is where there's a not, the mother is just a custodian. She's a field. The Euroboros is basically the sectioning off of, uh, you know, it's so hard to speak about this, but without dipping into language, it is really not appropriate. But say, say, think of it in terms of like the archetypal, new, uh, what is it? What does Newman even call it? The pleroma. We're all, we all come out of the mystery of the pleroma. Then a circle, you know, gets created in which now we can talk about something that's individuated to that degree. Very, very, it's like the ego germ. It's even wrong to use terms like con, you know, consciousness and all of that, but it's like a certain sectioning off. And that's where this whole conversation takes place. And that's what's healthy. It's meant to happen. There's nothing wrong with this. It's the informing into the child or the infant's consciousness, the fetus's consciousness, all of that history and patterning that is already contained within the mother, right? The only trouble is that it goes wrong. It, often, it sometimes can go wrong, right? And where there's the self-conversation of the mother, because don't forget this is what's known as a phylogenetic chain. Hasn't she had a mother? Hasn't she, isn't she 20 or something? You know, she's had a whole lot of life experience as well. Uh, she's had, she's met men. She knows what men are. She knows what the male world is. And all of the sundry experiences that she had with this fetus has not even a clue about is in some way, uh, you know, creating impressions on that fetus's mind. And, and this is where then it can go wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it has to. I mean, you, you actually make the example in the book about if you take any sort of organism in, in the natural world, it, it will be dictated to by its uh, its environment or the hostility of that environment. Why why do we suggest that we're somehow, um, you know, outside of nature in that regard? You know, it's it's almost it's just common sense, isn't it? That, you know, what it must get passed down. Uh, you actually talk about ancestral collective trauma. Um, you know, could you could you touch upon you talk about a cataclysm. Is there one particular historical event that, that, that's sort of been passed down and we've uh, lacked the, the memories of it to be able to heal it? Or is this just something that's just been going on through, throughout the history of time in terms of, you know, pillages, wars and battles and, you know, things that we, we are now unaware of? Yeah, it, it's all of the it, it, two different perspectives on that. Uh, trauma is trauma, whether people accept the more of the controversial cataclysm theory. Uh, they still can't deny trauma because then you look at just what you said. So the, the case for trauma is extremely strong, even though you barely find anybody talking about it. So what I did was I took a Newman's work and Otto Rank's work and other people, and then I, uh, I segued it into this like completely, apparently, you know, dissimilar <laughs> type of subject matter, right? Uh, and plugged that in. And I found something extremely important, you know, which psychologists never bother with. Everything they talk about traumatically is going to be, again, something that happens, you know, say child abuse or the Oedipus complex, mm -hmm. something that's happened during birth, after birth. But how on earth? You know, so I think my work is a major step forward uh, in the whole paradigm of psychology or, or social you know, psychology or whatever you want to call it, psychohistory or whatever, because I'm mm -hmm. plugging in the ancestral trauma. And that is a bedrock in all people, not just mothers, but everyone. We've got it as a seedbed. And then Absolutely. so personal psychology grows out of that. So the mm -hmm. child is also inheriting, guess what, the trauma of, of, the, of the ancient times as well. Absolutely. There's actually, I don't know if you know someone called Stanislav Groff, Groff uh, yeah. but they've done a lot of work in terms of regressing people back into the prenatal, uh, you know, sort of into the yeah. womb experience. And, you know, he talks about the, uh, uh, the, the he has four different matrices, matrices or matrices, I think he calls them. Uh, the first one being the feeling of being in that sort of uh, oceanic bliss of being in the womb. And people have that, have these sort of um, images of sort of nature and, you know, being in an ocean and, you know, the kind of the harmonious nature of life. Uh, mm -hmm. Then it moves into uh, then also the experience of the toxins from the mother, of the mother, which you talk about, which, uh, you know, can be represented with sort of archetypal images of demons and goblins and things like that. And then there's the, uh, I guess there's the, 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 the contractions that come from the, the birthing period, uh, which can be uh, images of sort of totalitarian regimes and concentration camps. And it's almost like a shared, a transpersonal shared experience of, of other people going through that sort of helpless, hopeless, you know, almost like an absurdity at life uh, uh, feeling. And then there's the, the actual birth itself, the struggle with the birth and, uh, you know, like being forced through the, uh, the birth canal. And this is where you get a lot of the uh, Groff talks about uh, the, the sexual energy and, and, and uh, being built up because that's where you get the sadomasochistic, you know, the strength, the strangulation of, of air sort of make, creates that sexual energy. And there's a lot of demonic archety archetypes of demons and war and murder and stuff like that. So it, it sort of ties into what you're saying, right? There's sort of a, there, there's a, there's a, there's a pool, there's a pool of unconscious material whereby we all share and we, we seem to, sh we seem to share these sort of symbols 
in these uh, in these states is that am i kind of is that sort of similar to what you, you've sort of gone through with your work oh yeah bang on you see in fact i didn't even know that stand up laugh graph went into that stuff i uh, i'm fascinated to hear that because well look first of all i'm bang on uh, totally in agreement with all of that absolutely everything you just said i agree with and, and these things fascinate me i'm learning as i go as well and I take a lot out of Arthur Yanov, who uh, comes to mind when you spoke about these things. He talks about the sympath and the empath mm. and uh, the birth canal, how it will make two, you know, more than two, but he has to, for brevity's sake, two types of being. The one who, you know, is a sort of more willful and masculine and somebody who's more weak and docile, mm. you know, and maybe more philosophical, inward looking. All of this is to do with the birth canal issue. Then, of course, slightly before that, there's other syndromes of the mother self conversation in the womb. He would, uh, he, 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 uh, because he's a bioenergetic psychologist, he focuses on cesarean versus, you know, birth canal, which mm -hmm. is another important point. Noticing that there's definite characteristic char differences in character between those two types. And I'm totally a believer in that. Mm -hmm. uh, I myself was a cesarean. So, you know, I can definitely look at that, say in contrast to say other people in my family and, and, and take the Yanov's theory. Uh, and really, I see it explaining things like that. So amazing work there by Arthur Yanov, the famous author of The Primal Scream and books of that nature. But um, mm. he was suppressed, of course. Yeah, we don't want any of that, do we? Because it leads to healing. And then if it leads to healing, we don't have a we don't have a big pharma. Sure, they're, they're absolutely. Yeah. That, right? <laughs> well, that's it. And you, you know, I think you've, you've mentioned this before, but that's the, uh, you know, the, the state, if you like, does not want to dismantle itself. It doesn't want to be dismantled. It's like a self-perpetuating organism you know and so it's somehow uh, maintaining itself by um i guess tricking people into believing that um men you know masculinity is is a uh, is the main issue um and by doing so you know men, men are you know only really the foot soldiers but in many ways i think would you agree that maybe that it, we're not actually living in a patriarchy but it's something more equivalent to a metaphysical matriarchy in which um, it, it continues because it tricks everyone to thinking that, that men are bad. We've never really had anything like a patriarchy. What we've had is a, a, a hybridized, you know, uh, matriarchy in which the male energy is used what I call chivalrically, not all the time, but in the great, in the great majority of time, it's like a, you know, a situation of like a, a termite a heap or, or an ant hive or, or bees in which there's plenty of masculine energy around, but it's of a certain limited kind. The one that decorates the urbanized environment without knowing what that's for and who's who's really controlling it, and chivalrically running around, you know, uh, sort of buffering and cushioning uh, a kind of womankind who's also lost their way. Uh, this is all again coming out of the womb situation, but it manifests in large in ways that we don't see or we have cognitive dissonance over it. So the kind of masculinity we have right now is just basically a parody of what it's really mm -hmm. about. And you're quite right; the institutions go for that. They've actually assisted in this thing because you know it might have been that it got healed but but with uh, these institutions it's less likely to get healed because they're very matrifocal they're very mm -hmm. uh into female supremacy and what have you and so the male is okay mm -hmm. he's accepted in, in that kind of society as long as he signs on for a particular worker and mentality and <laughs> hell what the hell they do they don't <laughs> even, it's not about them. i sign here they're already signing before you can tell them and yeah. they're out there doing it because mommy and daddy and the rest of society mm -hmm. and you'll never encounter somebody who, who tells you, you know, contrary to that. Yeah, you know, the, these are your Agent Smiths. You know, if you look at the Matrix movie, the Agent Smiths, they're the, mm -hmm. they're the, they're the foot soldiers of the state. And if, you know, the Agent Smiths, they're the, the complete uh, example of, um, you know, homogenization. They are, <laughs> there's, no, there's not an individual quality to them. No. And um, can you, Michael, could you touch upon um, that sort of, um, you know, you talk about the chivalric man. We're going to come on to the, the, six, the six types or the four malignant types of male and female that come from the terrible mother. Um, but could you, could you just, um, touch upon, uh, I was going to, what did I just say? I just lost my thread there for a minute. Um, Oh, the chivalric man. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. and, and, and the, and the proclivity to want to go back into a womb like state. In other words, the, the, the crowd or the collective. Well, remember in those types, especially the four malignant types, delusion is the order of the day. So all, all you have to do when you read those types is decide for yourself, which one is more deluded. I think it's really the chivalric man. I could be wrong. They all could be similarly deluded, but really because of the muscular physical supremacy of the male 
uh, he's the one who goes out to build the urban environment, right? And even the city, the word city, if you check into the deep etymology of that, it turns out to be a whole feminine thing, that a city is really a circular womb or hive. The very, uh, In fact, you'll even find rituals in Greece and Phrygia and God knows where else in the Middle East and also in the mm. Aegean cultures where the building of a wall around the city was entirely to indicate that this was a female precinct and all of that. So I want to get sidetracked into that. But since that energy is needed, man has the physical strength, then he had to be mind controlled and co-opted into building something that is ultimately, right at the very grassroots level, this dissimilar to his uh, need or his will. So he's already off kilter. So the most deluded, but then he has to be deluded in order to proceed in this without waking up to what the hell is going on. So all the urban environments we know, without any, you know, without any exception, are built according to female will. Right, mm -hmm. and not all of it negative. There's a Demetrian, what's known as a Demetrian uh, aspect of this, which is just women instead of saying we don't want to all hang out with women. We want, we're mothers too. Women are mothers. I, mm -hmm. You know, I'm a mother, so I want to settle. I don't like this nomadic lifestyle. Uh, we need the urban environment. We need a fixed place. So whether it was logical or illogical, rational or irrational, it was a it was a decision of the female will, and for some reason people went along with it. So agriculture began as opposed to say the nomadic lifestyle. And it goes on from there. But come up more to the point of your question is, the deluded male is one who witlessly, without any knowledge of the engine behind his will to power, runs out there and goes, right, mama, I'm, I'm doing, you know, hi, mom. You know, it's like daddy showed you how to do everything. And as soon as you appear on stage in front of the whole world, it's hi, mom, that type. And he builds himself up. He's usually bodily, very armored. His behavior, we could talk hours for it, is pretty much your typical male today. Yeah. And then they beef themselves up and their mentality is to, you know, whatever. And they run out there to build the world without the faintest idea. So they're very, very regressed and backward when it comes to psychology. And you can beat them over the head with sledgehammers to get, understand the stuff we're talking about. They'll never, ever listen to you because it's just throw your coat over the puddle for the female. You know, they're deified to the point of absurdity just because they are women. Uh, and that's where it ends for them. And their, their, their reward is in literally laying down their lives. So all that masculinity, what looks like masculinity, you know, this sort of the swashbuckling Errol Flynn mentality, is, you know, is actually a facade. It's actually a parody of real masculinity, which doesn't do any of these things and demands equality of the real level, not what feminists are using mm -hmm. that word so blatantly and so flagrantly wrongly. There's another kind of equality, an equality of will and understanding that has long been erased you know, because of what we're talking about. But the study of the chivalric male is actually in that book, and it was partly written. See, it's funny enough, you know, people have said when they read the book, it's really more an indictment of masculinity than it is femininity. And I first balked at that, but then I went, oh, wait a minute, you're right. I read it myself again, you know, in that light, but you know something, they're blinking right. Yeah. It's not meant to be an indictment of anything, actually, but it's just in the workings out of the book. You have to you know, put things into typologies so that the truth can come forth. Absolutely. Actually, whilst we're on that, let, let's go straight into the into the types of, uh, you know, the, the four malignant types, just to, so for everyone to sort of uh, keep up in a way. Um, so we talk about the the, uh, the the first type being the masculinized female. See, I think these terms threw me at first, Michael, because when you hear the term, the first one you use is the masculinized female. And then we go into the feminized female and then we have the terrible mother. Have I got that right? Those are the first yeah. three. And then we have, of course, the masculinized male, the feminized male and the chivalric male. Yeah. And when I hear the masculinized female, I, I immediately think of a masculine woman in terms of being almost animus possessed, the Kathy Newman type, if you like. But that's actually what you refer to as the terrible mother, I believe, right? This sort of cold and, you know, sort of Medu a Medusa-like um, sort of cut off her feelings and sort of more controlling. Is that right? More the feminist well, type. Basically, in the typology, I look at the masculine feminine as the, as, uh, sorry, the masculine female as, as the normal type. Right. Uh, the terrible mother is an aberration of that. The masculine female is the one we want, right? Uh, and there's no mystery to that type, really. They're masculine because they admire men, and, and they, they were integrated easily mm. into the masculine world of the father. They identified with the father. They, they weren't all messed up psychologically through the Oedipus. Right. And they found the transit. You know, if you use uh, Julius Christeva has a nice tripart, uh, you know, scheme where it's, you know, you're coming from the childhood across a sort of a bridge, say, and then you get in, you get introduced just like opening a door to the world of the father. And what's implied in that, right, is also implied deeply in the Dragon Mother book, which is that the uh, uh, entrance into the solar world does take time 
And, and the key of it is it's later. Can't stress that enough, right? Mm. So the mother has complete dominance, even though there's a father pattern about, mm. and even though he was important in getting, getting you conceived, that's about the limit of it. You got to go almost to almost, you know, appear to five to seven years before you're really introduced to what the father's world is, yeah. the world of men uh, and hopefully masculine men and all of that. So this is where Freud kind of missed it because there's absolutely what constitutes epochs of time. You know, the famous seven, right, is considered a, a life within a life. And in most of that time, it's the female consciousness that dominates. So when a woman is a masculinized type, you breathe a sigh of relief because when you meet that girl, say she's seven or 12 or 14, and she's sort of tomboyish and very, you know, up, you know, mm. works with the world easily and effectively and doesn't recoil from men. Isn't this little wormy, mm. uh, frigid, you know, bashful type. That's good. That's good. That's a relief. And good. Thank goodness. There's still loads and loads of women like that in the world to oppose these feminist types. And, you know, who stay rational and they go to college, they do well and they build families and they mean well. And thank goodness that type is still in the world, right? So I look at that type as being, you know, equal to men. And the yeah. main thing, the diagnosis of them, when you want to find out what mm. is this woman a masculine woman, you will not hear them uh, decry men, envy men, put men down. They'll be, you know, actually defending the cause of males, yeah. like a kind of an Ayn Rand is, is an absolute mm. apotheosis of that kind of woman. And there are many mm. others. Yeah, I, you know, I refer to it as the in, the integrated female, if you like. They've integrated yeah, both yeah, the masculine and, you know, and they embrace their femininity. That's also something I wanted to mention. You mentioned Definitely. that in the book as well, you know, whereas it's almost like the other types you mentioned, there's a distortion of masculine energy, you know, or feminine energy. It kind of goes one of, goes to the other ends of the spectrum, if you like. So if we talk about now the, the, the feminized female, when I read that, I, I just immediately thought of the damsel in distress, you know, the kind of the, uh, the in the Disney movies, you know, the sort of... Uh, uh, you know, hyper, hyper passive, um, sort of docile, um, awaiting the Prince Charming to come along, if you like. And, you know, I see these being played out in terms of, you know, you sort of your, your Instagram girls that sort of don't have much of a life. They don't really know themselves, but they're sort of posting up a new picture every two minutes in the hope of some validation and some, some, some men, some of the chivalric men you talk about to come and, you know, rescue them, if you like. Um, I definitely see that being being played out. Is there any anything you want to sort of add to that? I mean, that you, you mentioned they're also addicted to um, a man that, that not not of his values. They're not interested in his values, but they're just seeking what he can supply in terms of uh, infrastructure and, I guess, strength, because those are all the aspects that she has abdicated within herself. Have I got that right? Yeah, exactly right. And the passivity that you mentioned is important too. These are the women that Otto Weininger said. These are, I think, it was Nietzsche might have said, uh, when you, when you'll never learn anything about female psychology from women. Well, I would qualify that only by saying you might learn something from the masculine woman, who's an open book, you know, who's willing to discuss mm -hmm. rationally subjects that, like this, like psychology and stuff. The, the, the type you're just mentioning now doesn't know anything about femininity masculinity they're the docile female who and again it might uh, when you started with talking about you know the womb experience and Groff mm. and Lowen, hey you know there may be a lot to be said about why that feminized female exists because of the womb situation either mm. from the self conversation which at this point would be aberrant because remember this feminine female is a abnormal type but this would be a pathological type mm. so yes it would be but it's very attractive. That type is actually very attractive to the chivalric man. In fact, he goes for it, you know, with a passion. Absolutely. This is one of the reasons why we're in the mess we're in right now is because unfortunately that type, you know, you watch it in Clint Eastwood films, you, you'll see this type. I don't know whether he's commenting on it consciously or it's just a, something dramatic, but the type that men go for, now she goes for that type because having no backbone, having no really earthy grounded will, her mother has so shaken her will, so through matrophobia and I think the real dragon fight, the woman's that, that that type of person's will has been so un, undermined by her terrible mother that that's what she's doing. She's installing a backbone mm. when she hangs on to the chivalric man. He thinks it's just wonderful, <laughs> and he's writing odes to joy and odes to you know love and all that. He has no idea what's going on. If he pulled back, if the masculine world pulled back, these people would crumble. They rely deeply on the urban environment uh, to you know, to provide those handrails. And they were, and then even more, they will rely on a very, what appears to be the stereotypical, you know, um, male uh, in, in sort of the more stereotypical way. He's the guy who goes out to fight for their honor. He'll, you know, slaughter her enemies. 
you know, he'll bring the meat to the table and all of this stuff. Not see, we're talking about typologies. Every one person is all of these types. So we have to make sure we mention that as well. They're not hard to find. You have to do that when we're sketching mm -hmm. it out. But everyone, even the masculine woman has feminine traits. Even the chivalric man has masculine traits. It's just that they get warped in, in, in various they get, ways. They get stuck. They get stuck in certain, certain sort of states. Um, I was going to say the sh the chivalric man when I when I read that I you know I see that as the pseudo alpha male it's almost like the Jersey right. Shore the pickup artist you know the uh, the kind of oozing that sort of uh, pseudo machismo um, Baywatch you know, Baywatch there you go yeah I mean I see this all the time you know if you go if you go just to your local local pub you see these types of uh, people all the time and they do they do attract each other because I think on some energetic level. The, uh, they're both narcissists in a way. You have the overt narcissist in terms of these uh, cocksure sort of guys uh, who, you know, who they can drink the most pints, they can arm wrestle, you know, they're, they kind of want to, they want to outdo each other. Um, and then you have the, 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 the attraction with that is with the, the sort of the victim uh, dynamic within the, the girls, you know, and it's sort of, that's in a way a, a codependence, which is what, which is what attracts them together in the first place. Um, and then we talk about um, the, feminized male so the feminized male is someone who's abdicated his, his divine masculine i guess it's someone who's who's who doesn't have his backbone he's supplicating to uh the mother in effect he's the he's the people pleaser he's the hugh grant is that right he's a sort of yeah. he'll, t he'll turn up to a date with a bunch of roses and everyone knows how that goes down on a date <laughs> yeah <laughs> You know, in these old, old uh, Spielberg movies, you know, where you see the dweeby guy with the glasses. That's right. He's made, he's made several movies like that. Even in Jaws, you see these losers and they can't get the chick, <laughs> you know, the blonde, you know, and there's many other, you know, yeah. sort of the, camp, the campus nerds. Uh, and you will, I'm not being facetious here because their body, I know several of these people and their body will also show you that they're, they, they're feminized, you know, in many ways. You could be wrong on, on, on occasion, but generally speaking, they're sort of slouched over, wimpy, Pudgy. Uh, now they're well known. The hipsters and the soy boys yeah. all fit this. So we don't have to really draw pictures from people because our whole world is now absolutely littered with this type. Where did they come from? I mean, it's like something out of Doctor Who. Did these guys climb out of the slime or something? <laughs> yeah. <But just laughs> a, yeah, it's funny though. Because the, 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 sorry to interject, but I just I thought it was really hilarious. If you watch movies, they they champion these these nerds, you know. And by the end of the movie, you'll see that they they somehow manage to. Uh, convert the the hot babe at the high school from going from the bad boy to then getting with him, and it's like it's it's telling such a an unrealistic story. It's unbelievable. Okay. Yes, it does. But at the same time, you'll see a lot of women who are even appear very masculine who actually go around with men like this. So that's a whole other conversation. But you know the way. Say say we go back one step to the feminized female. You remember how it's a it's sort of a. Um, not an axiom, but it's this sort of dictum that women like a tall man. He must be tall, right? Mm. See, that is the that's the feminized female, right? Who lacks masculinity, compensating for it in a stupid stereotype. Yeah, the man may be a serial killer. He's nice and tall. In fact, most serial killers are nice and tall. Would you like one of them then? See, so mm. when you unpeel it, you find that it's ludicrous, right? But they, it's entered into our culture. But from feminized females who really lacking an inner masculine. See, if, remember, if you were equal, you would it wouldn't matter what kind of man comes in. You judge him by his true masculinity, not by some effect of it or some simulacra of it or parody of it. Or like you said, the false. It's like an alpha male, not, but, you know, mm. he, he, has, he has some of the bearing. Well, again, the feminized male has can have some of the bearing of a male because he's born a male. So he might even have. Mm you know, uh, the build or whatever, but that doesn't stop him being highly feminized. And as you say, bring in roses and, mm. you know, waxing lyrical and down on one knee. And, and again, mm. this is a dangerous, dangerous pathological type because that is the type of person uh, who along with the chivalric male tends to deify women to heights that they yeah. don't deserve. Yeah. Women should be respected. Like I'm saying, men should be respected, but the deification of woman, just because she is woman, you're going to find it in the Shelf Alaric man, but you find it on steroids when it comes to this feminized type who looks at women as all goddesses. So mothers, women of all kinds, and women love their, their, the company of that eunuch, that sort of uh, castrata type, you know, in mm. parentheses, because those are the most men. And the gay man would be a, one of yes. these types. Who, yeah. who Women love their company. Uh, they can often perform a lot of the, the uh, deeds of a chivalric male, but they're not as uh, preposterous. 
So you get this as well. It's a flip side mm-hmm. of the of the coin of the chivalric man, but to me, just as preposterous and just as uh, you know, pathological. Just as preposterous, absolutely. And you'll actually find these femini- feminized males, they will attract the terrible mothers. I find, or you know, the sort of the cold, the headstrong business women, the ones that are wearing the trousers, because there always has to be that dynamic of uh, control and 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 uh, receptivity, if you like, if you like, uh, the acquiescence. Yes, you know. indeed. So you see that say as as we talked about the. Uh, the what did we say? The, the uh, there was the other one I mentioned. That's right. The the chivalric man, as you call it, the pseudo alpha male attracts the feminized female. I do believe the um, feminized male attracts the terrible mother. I see that all the time. You know, and these guys they're just like little little lap dogs. Um, you know, to, to her every will. They don't have a voice. They're just yeah. They're just sort of you know. Uh, <laughs> they're they're being worn out by their partners basically. Um, and so what, what does the masculinized male look like then? What, what are his values? What does, what is real masculinity look like? The easy answer to that is that that's the kind of male who is so rooted in himself, who didn't have a terrible mother. I mean, you still can have one and, and grow straight, which is thank goodness for that. But usually the mother has brought them up to be men and has to admire the male world. I would go for a masculine woman or a masculine man. So the masculine man follows the same, you know, uh, contour. He has, He's entered the solar world easily. Uh, he's not blind. He sees the negatives, but he is very respectful of what men have done. And I would always put that in the context of the Western world. That's just a peccadillo, right? Because uh, I think a lot of Eastern cultures are deeply feminized in a way that we're becoming, but have not been up until now. Mm-hmm. So, you know, Scots, Irish man, Anglo-Saxon man, Teutonic man, uh, they uh, really revere, you know, uh, what their forebears have done. And so what they will do, one of the signs of that is they will not let anyone in their life, their partner, their girlfriend, you see the people they meet, their best mates, they will not allow those people to collapse or crumble. So one of the things of the masculine man is he is kind of, a, uh, he's not chivalric, which is, as you say, a, 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 a parody of it, but they will sort of supervene and make sure that their culture doesn't slide. And that the people that they know rise to their highest uh, capacity. Now, this man is hated. I, uh, in other work, I've, I've also shown it that it's really the third and fourth imago. I don't know if we have time to go there. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's looking at it from a female. Well, maybe we should. Yeah. In, a li- in, the woman of a li- in the life of a woman, right? And this, again, is very abbreviated because there's a lot more imagos than what I'm going to say. But there's four main imagos that are of the male that a woman encounters, right? One and two are more humble and, you know, earthy and work a day. And there's nothing wrong with them. There's nothing evil in it. And then there's the third and the fourth that are different because they're more intellectual. They have maybe higher IQs. They certainly have a broader, uh, you know, quest. Uh, the, and the fourth Amago really does. He's more a priest type. He's more a sage type. Mm. The third one is more an intellectual, say, in a college sense or a professor or an intellectual, a great writer. Like Marilyn Monroe went with Arthur Miller. That's a perfect third Amago. But she couldn't transcend that and actually slip back the second and first Amagos you know, sadly to say, but that's what I mean. And there's many examples of that. Uh, A woman who marries a successful politician who's trying to change the world, he does well, Mm. you know, he has a humanitarian streak and he's always waxing about, you know, some philosophical paradigm, all of like that. Then there's the fourth imago. But what I've noticed and what is an absolute fact is that women dislike the fourth imago. They'd much rather, you couldn't pull teeth to get them to go with that guy. That's why the fourth imago doesn't exist in our world is because it's been, uh, you know, uh, it's been bred out because of the fact that nobody wants or cares about him. But that fourth imago is similar to what we're talking about now, is, a, is definitely a masculinized male. Mm. And there's many examples of, of that, right? In, both in fiction and in uh, no, normal daily life. It's what the male really should have been if he had not been molested by socialism and mm. Frankfurt School and all this other nonsense, right? But it's a person who has a deeper sense of caring, not only about the world, the urbanized world, you know, within that Euroboric uh, circle, but also cares about nature. And so his children are going to be, you know, not as urbanized, even if they live in an urban environment, that father is going to be somebody who takes those children out to nature to paint it or to learn about it or to keep animals or to visit frequently, you know, uh, uh, nature and have picnics and things and just take them out swimming and all of mountain climbing and all of these kinds of things. That would be a masculine kind of man. You're not going to find any feminized man stepping one, you know, stepping one uh, foot outside the urban environment. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. The only time I can see them doing that is actually, uh, I was actually thinking about, if you look at swimming pools that children go to, I think that's almost like a kind of, uh, 
uh, a representation of the womb you know so you you actually have the red slides you know in swimming pools i think that's almost like a kind of a willingness to return back to the womb and these feminized men that you talk about you also mentioned in the book about how they have such a they're they're displacing well let's use it let's put it this way uh they are looking to return back to that womb like experience but they do it through um, you know, joining, as you say, these uh, these unions or or, or or socialist sort of regimes and uh, policies and stuff like that, because in in their mind, uh, that's what's going to bring us back to that sort of oceanic bliss of the womb. Is that is that kind of? Uh... Yes, that's very key. It's a difficult concept unless people have thought about it. But in short, what it means is that politics cannot be understood without psychology, and and mm. socialistic leftist politics definitely can't be understood until you come from to it from a psychological point of view and then the next step would be you've already explained it what is it it's a building a city building a mm. orwellian superstructure that yeah. is based in surveillance based in uh, male hatred mm. uh, envy of the male as well as it mixed in there you know all of that and basically run by either women or by the next best thing, which is the worker ants again, but this time they either fall into two categories, feminized men, which you get lots of, like yeah. George Soros, mm. uh, and many others I could mention, or this preposterous Anthony Robbins inflated balloon animal, mm. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, who looks and walks and talks like a male, but mm. guess what? And maybe even taken by the whole of humanity as a male, but mm. isn't one, really, when, you know, when you peel off the mask. Mm. So, yeah, dire, dire things here, yeah. It's all it's done. To return to see the can't you can't return to the womb physically. Mm. So then you create simulacras of it. The crowd would be the number one, yeah. but then what the crowd wants is number two, three, and four. See the crowd, the will of the crowd is actually moving our world and has done now for a very, very long time. Whereas the spirit of Anglo-Saxon man is the individual. Mm. So where, where's that today? For goodness sake, that's a relic. Absolutely, it's almost like the, the this kind of uh, distortion of 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 wanting to return back to that woo. So basically to the womb, the in, intra-uterine uh, uh, mm. feeling, is actually what leads people to yeah, what, want to um, push for socialism and, and, in effect, total statism. Uh, and I actually think that the, the, uh, the uh, feminine, if you like, the kind of uh, this, 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 uh, the distorted feminine, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, the extri- it's all about subjectivity. And that's why we see people say, you know, feelings over facts, if you like. It's just whatever they want, it's what they can be. If they, they think they're, a, you know, if, if they, if they want to be a, a tree, they can be a tree. You know, don't hurt their feelings, you know, all that kind of thing. It's almost like subjectivity is coming in now. Total receptivity. So the feminine is about receptivity. That's why we're seeing total open borders. You know, the breaking down of the masculine quality of boundaries and borders. And then we have the collective and the, and, the, and, and the fear of the individual. These, to me, are all the aspects of the distorted feminine that we see being played out right now. And if it goes too far, it will lead to you know, totalitarianism, a total uh, homogenization of society. In effect, it's cancer because it's, what cancer does, it attacks the host cells and, of a body. And that's what we're seeing now, uh, you know, geopolitically. We're seeing the breakdown of the host cells because we're seeing the host nation being eroded. It's being the open borders being replaced by incomers um, and those uh, the host cells are being destroyed you know and so what we're seeing actually happening in the in in, in Europe right now is almost like the, the the terrible mother it's almost like the terrible mother's influence uh, 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 being played out can you can you see something similar to that Michael I agree with everything you're saying and uh, they've, it's interesting when you see how they've done it they've taken feminine motifs uh, and they style their cities, their policies on subliminally feminine concepts, the panopticon, the kind of global village, Mm. uh, just like you said, the swimming pools, the designs of even physical buildings, locations, a lot of the symbolism, a great deal of the symbolism. Uh, I first tried to come at this, you know, before I wrote the two books, my way of coming at everything we're talking about was to try and, you know, soften the blow and just talk about general symbolism and, uh, you know, it was marginally successful, but then I just decided, look, what the hell? <laughs> gloves off. Keep going, yeah. So, yeah. But basically, that was correct. The, the way that they're sending it through, that's why there's more women in politics. That's why you have an Angela Merkel and these other creatures. So it's coming at you now almost unadulteratedly through a feminine mode because that, mm. that's the lure. Because everything evil that these Orwellian guys are doing couldn't be done unless there was a hankering and an urge within us to go for it. And that's that, as I said, no political action can be understood 
Mm. You know, their agendas and all can only be understood by those who are psychologically empowered to know how they're using the feminine and the need for the return to this in, in mm. Toronto state, yeah. the Euroboric state. We want to go back to that. So the external version is mm. what you see on, on uh, the theater of the world or in society, like crowd consciousness. And just in the same way that you can barely get one of these people at Burning Man to accept anything we're talking about, it, they're impervious to it. So the danger lies in the fact that they're not self-reflexive anymore. Reason is reason because reason can also discern what is the counterpoint to the idea I hold. Well, that's, that's gone. The education system, mm. uh, it was never very strong to start with, but it's totally obliterated now. Reason is not reason because reason said, here's what I believe, here's what I cherish. But by the way, I can tell you all the you know, refutation to everything I hold. And that was the rational Gre Grecian you know, mode of education. That's completely gone. All I know is that mm. you actually alluded to it earlier. All they know is what they want to know. Exactly. It's, you know. But in law, when you arrest somebody for a serious crime, uh, you're, we're not arresting you on what you felt. We're arresting you on what you did. So you're, you, when you get lifted and you're taken down, well, I feel you. we're not interested in that. You broke a law. It's what you did, not what you feel. So Absolutely. the feminine, the feminine <laughs> yes, mode the feminine mode has turned that over, right? The masculine says, we have to, I'm sorry, mate, but you have to go to jail. You know, we have to penalize you, give you a fine or whatever. You're in our books now because of what you did. The female is saying, forget what they did. It's how he felt. Mm. Oh, well, there's the end of civilization right there. Yeah, they, they've weaponized fe uh, the female characteristics. Empathy, inclusivity, diversity, compassion. And, you know, the path to hell is paved with good intentions. And I, I, I'm actually, I wonder if there's actually a connection between the, 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 the simultaneous Me, the Me Too movement, which is obviously a, uh, the shaming of the masculine, and the simultaneous breakdown of borders geopolitically. Because in effect, on an energetic level, it's the, it's the denigration of, of, of the male property, if you like. And I wonder if, there's, I, I wonder if that's not a coincidence that that's happened at the same time, you know. I um, don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Yes, uh, there was a one of the greatest apologists for f female supremacy is J.J. Bakofen, right? This is, you know, the previous century or whatever. And he made a statement and he said that when civilizations fall, in the moment of their fall, in their declination, they return to what they were at the beginning. Nietzsche said it in other ways. So in other words, whatever society was like in the beginning, in the primordial, that primordial uh, phenomena, right, will return when... Uh, civilization starts to decay. And that's what we're seeing because their origin of, of, of urban life, as I said, was based on a female model and females, and, and that was dictated by female supremacy, their will. Man has been given the delusion that he was the creator. No, he wasn't. Right Now we're seeing that again. We're seeing all the same effects at the end of civilization that came in the beginning. And this supremacy will, will be the decline of, of what we know. But pertaining to what you just said, if you go back to those primordial days, now we, we can't go back, but you can read the Mercia Eliads and all of the different scholars that I deal with, right? They're telling you that there were no borders. The, the ethos of the Great Mother is this. Mm. I give birth to all the fruit. Some are black, some are orange, some are white, some are you know bent double, whatever. But everything that comes out of my womb, all the races, all the people, are my children. So there mm. cannot be any borders. This is the feminine way. And we see that now exactly typified in what's happening with this borderless, mm. multicultural, you know, sludge world that we're living, right? Where any blow-ins can just come in and sup off our tables and, mm. uh, and say, eh, what, you, what, what, what you own is mine, what you created is mine, you know, and all the rest of it. Mm. But all of this piracy and all of this predation doesn't matter. In the female mind, we're all equal. Now, the trouble with that is, and I've made, made this before, is that they're not taking a census. They're not asking anybody, do you want to go along with this? They're clubbing you out of the way and say, you will go along with it. Therefore, you know they're not free. So the socialist groups are the fascist groups. And George Soros is not saying, here's what we all believe. I got it from the Frankfurt School. Let me read it to you. And now, hands up, who wants to go with this? Because most Anglo-Saxon white men, you know, the 10% who build the bridges and actually know what the hell it takes to build civilization and lay the infrastructure will go, no, we're not going for that. And that would tip the balance. Today, they don't ask you. They, and, and in mm. fact, they do worse. They seduce you through the media. The media, mm. like you said, Twitter and these things, and Facebook, exactly, you said correctly, but these sites where the woman just puts up uh, 5,000 images of herself from different angles mm. and all of this, what that meant to achieve, not quite sure, but it's mm. like narcissism on steroids, right? Well, they're not asking you, right? They're, they're luring you through the image, and mm. they want the male gaze to fold back on itself. But you're quite right. If you go back to the primordial, the primordial 
consciousness of the, of the great mother and her disciples was, ye are all from my womb. I see no separation or division between you. So let's get rid of all of these borders and boundaries. Mm. And from their angle, that is sacrosanct. There's not even an argument. And often you have to blink twice and, and get back into your reason to say, no, no, but there is an argument. Hold, stop. I'm not buying into that because it sounds so nice. And because what all of us did indeed come from a womb. There's a tremendous drag factor to believe mm. philosophies like that because of the black hole effect of it. And so to hold back, you know, uh, to hold back from that and awaken from the trance is next. Actually, it's quite impossible now. You see men just completely falling down like something. It's like an extraordinary effect where people are just collapsing, you know, when this mm. meme comes Absolutely. into their heads. They just go, holy are thou, and boom, they're gone. There's Absolutely. not even a masculine thread left. I mean, you see this with, uh, you know, for instance, the weaponization of compassion for the planet with the climate change, you know, uh, the, uh, agenda. Oh, well, you know, it's unbelievable. You know, I have conversations with people that think they're in their masculine, and they said, "But look, ninety-seven percent of scientists have said." I'm like, <laughs> you know, it's such a collect, it's such a, it's such a, a wishy, wishy-washy, pathetic, uh, collectivized thing. You know, eight out of ten cats like this cat food. You know, it's just the the, yeah, the lack of the lack of intelligence that goes on with that argument is just fucking. But you can't argue against it. That. You can't even argue no, against it because, no. because you're, you're effective. What I've worked out is you're effectively arguing with the woman. <laughs> you know, it's like, a, it's like a domestic. It's like, you know, whatever the woman says, that, you know, you have to take that as gospel. But the, the man, he's, he's immediately a criminal. It's almost because of that female and male quality, the male being considered to be the, the, the evil one, the bad one, and the woman always being the innocent one. We mm -hmm. see that being played out politically in terms of like, because... This is a feminine quality looking after the planet. You can't say anything again. If you do, you're you're evil or there's something wrong with you. You know, again, it's you. It's using the mapping of the of the of the psychology to uh, to, to to fit its ends. You know, Super it's almost like they have learned more about our psychology than we have learned about theirs. When I say ours and theirs, I mean the feminine types, right? Who are now politicized. Remember, this is a group that had no power. Yeah. But uh, from the time of the Frankfurt School, and you know, arguably before. Um, it's been highly weaponized and it is it, it has studied us so well you know because one of my biggest messages is we've got to turn that around you know and i personally have tracked it to all sorts of extraordinary things uh, one one way of looking at it is when women of certain cultures and these would be the more gynocratic women actually did physically observe tribes where the father son relationship was very strong this does happen mm. and they objected to it and so a lie mechanism was begun in which women would learn to lie about paternity, you know, and, uh, we, mm. we can go into that now. We'll have to maybe explore that in another show or whatever. But mm. uh, it, it, they didn't come up with that lie just because one day somebody woke up and said, let's just lie to men about their paternity. No, it came from observing something they disliked, something that they knew if it continued would ultimately undermine female supremacy. And it's nothing more than the father son bond. It did exist. And then women seeing it, some women seeing it, started, you know, these matriarchal leaders said, we don't want it. So then what happened was a centuries long, right up to the Grecian period, what we would know in the rise of the Hellenic period, or the, just the Grecian period, uh, followed by the Roman, you know, and then the modern and all that, or the Christian and then the modern. But just before the Hellenic period, women had for centuries lied systematically to men about paternity, right? Some men knew about it, but the vast majority were told a pack of lies. And that was to maintain female supremacy. So what does this mean in modern you know, terms? It means that all of feminism's endless critiquing about some aberration in the, in the masculine or solar world, right? the patriarchy is constantly deconstructed and critiqued. Yeah, but feminism is only doing that not because there is an actual right, aberration within patriarchy. Right? No, there is. That's wrong. They they want to make it that there is that there's errors and flaws and uh, aberrations within the phenomenon we know as patriarchy. When in fact, once you finally crack this nut, you find out that it is merely to reinstantiate female supremacy that is the movement behind world global feminism. Right? Not because there are actual objectionable. Well, there are objectionable things in patriarchy. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, but not to the level we're talking about of a wholesale collapse in the phenomena. So one must get it right when you're dealing with these feminists, which I don't actually advocate. But anyway, imagine hypothetically you're in conversation with one of these fruitcakes. Mm. The way to come at them is through the things I've systematically laid down in my work, and one of them is to show them that their ardor, their passion for de deconstructing masculinity and in, in patriarchy, is not because there is actual flaws in it. 
but because there is a previous primordial uh, rivalry to that patriarchy, which is the supremacy of feminine, you know, the feminine. And that needs to be reinstantiated by these people and is a very much a subconscious drive. In others, it's conscious, we've studied it. In others, it's just a, an engine, an atavistic throwback. Right? And then, then, of course, once you commit to that, a woman will then happily find all sorts of aberrations. So the history of feminism is really the discovery or the, um, or the finding of this and that flaw and this and that error in order to throw in the face of masculinity. But what I'm doing is going back to the nucleus of why this thing happened. Because they didn't want the father-son, which is the essence of patriarch, and there's nothing evil about it. Not one thing evil about the father-son relationship. Mm. But it is the, that's what patriarchy really is when you boil the phenomena back. And that is what affronted the women who said, but then that weakens our urba, urbanization and many of the other motifs that come with matriarchy. That father-son relationship is contra to it. And we must make sure that it you know, is weakened. And they weakened it by a wholesale lie, mm. which no one on this bloody planet addresses but myself. You know, I found it in, in, mm. in all sorts of places, you know, subtly put. But what it amounted to was centuries and centuries and centuries of deception, which if the man was the culprit, oh, my God, see if you turn this around and you say, well, the feminists dug up something of this magnitude, we would be crawling around. We'd be forced to crawl around hands and feet. And we'd be, have a day. They'd have a day in the week where we'd have to worship at shrines of the female. Go, sorry, sorry. Here's a few candles, you know. As a man, I recognize our historical, you know, but on the other side, women have shown no guilt, no contrition, not even, don't even really know about it. It's in the Old Testament, sort of, you know, somewhat, you know, there. But again, you won't find a woman who, who wastes one tear on the history of female crime going on for millennia and which weakened the father-son bond, uh, which in turn then changed the whole direction and constitution of what we call civilization. So back to the original point. I don't believe we have masculinity. I don't even believe we've got real civilization. We've got a pathetic, weakened simulacra, like weakened somebody mixing concrete, but unfortunately they were half asleep and they didn't do it properly. And so the very concrete holding our world together is feminized, weak, watery, mm. and a couple of pushes from the right direction, which is what's happening now politically, and the whole thing could collapse. Well, there's a bloody house of cards to start with. So if we're all going to go down in the stew, you know, my message to people is, well, at least we know what, why it happened. As opposed to going down completely clueless, going, you know, did you hear a bang? I didn't hear anything. I prefer we have knowledge in, of the matter, as desperate as it is. I mean, they, they, they talk about patriarchy, and you mentioned it there, but the patriarchy that they refer to is a, a system whereby men are keeping women down. But the, what oh, you're right. referring to is just what I, what I refer to as patrilineal. It's just the passing down of, of property to the father, to the son, and the, the natural expression of, the, uh, of, of our natural biological roles in synergy with each other. And that's always been the case up until the last couple hundred years, you know, and now that's being dismantled in, because it's being uh, considered... Uh, tyrannical you know and that's the uh, that's the war that's going on but we only have the feminized men to uh, counter it unfortunately and a, and a very tiny percentage of masculinized men um now michael can i just because we're coming to an end and i'd really like to tie the loop on some of these things because we kind of we went off on quite a few different uh, strands there what's the way out of this let's say for the for the firstly for the for the masculine you, you mentioned in the book about the artist and i really like that because you know for me the artist bucks the trend they rebel against the state they uh they're not frightened of destroying things as picasso said you know the the urge to create um the urge to destroy is a creative one you know and they foster their own identity uh, you know individual style so i really like the idea of the artist is there any anything else that we can suggest to men you know maybe the the the, you know, being in touch with Logos or, you know, how can they maybe in, uh, change their uh, environment hygienically? Is there anything that you'd suggest as just some practical things they could try? Well, that's huge because, you know, the solutions area is primarily about knowing that enemy, first of all, right, which that's why I do things in a systematic way and also why it's taken me a long time to even get to this subject, which, which actually was one of the first subjects I was studying. Mm. You know, so it's a peculiar road and it's not for everybody either. I think this will only happen when there's, because you need to know Nietzsche, you need to know Otto Rank, you need to know Arthur Yanov, you need to, as you say, Stanislav Grof. There's a tremendous uh, learning curve involved. Eric Schneumann, who the hell's going to pick up these people, right? So I try to condense it. So knowledge of the enemy is very important, because as I said earlier, somehow these feminists have really, you know, learned a lot about the, the, the masculine psyche. And that's how, you know, the situation we have came about. So we have to turn that around. On the art front, well, that's because we need to also then open up a lot of, you know, remember you asked what was the real masculine man, right? Mm. Well, he's not the chivalric type whose relationship with his own body 
And in Reishian terms, you see, when I say body, I mean shadow. So here's where the, you know, there's, there's a little bridge between Jung and Reish that probably they didn't even realize existed. But there is. And that is that the body, the chivalric man with a six pack and his broad shoulders carrying the weight of the world and carrying the weight of mother, you know, that's not, that's not what it's all about. There's a different kind of model, you know, more like the Bruce Lee type of model in which the body is speaking to you constantly and your disciplines like Tai Chi, Aikido, whatever it may be, or hybrid of those things, you know, more, more of a martial arts type of framing will be what is also needed. And that's art. And then there's other, you know, the more hands-on art of pottery, calligraphy, you know, music, painting, all of that, because that's opening the imagination. Now, one leads to the other. They're very closely connected, right? So the real masculine man is artist, but he's also artisan. So he's working with wood, he's working with stone, he yeah. teaches his kids how to carve things, you know, he gets the calligraphy pens out, he gets the pottery out, uh, they go around and tinker in nature, you know, and learn about the ways of animals. And a lot of these things, or even the weather, you know, it's like all of that, all these things that are slowly, slowly being erased by our digitized, you mm -hmm. know, society, or narcissistic society, in which the laptop and the camera, you know, is all now a mirror, I've, I've spoken about that as well which sort of is another aspect of feminization, you know. So it's a multiplicity of things, but art is very important because it opens up not only communion with the imagination and helps you, because remember, this, what we're talking about here is fighting great evil. You're not going to be able to do it from just a pure rational you know, point of view. There's, there's more to it. You have to dig down into the reservoirs of inner bioenergy, inner power. Mm. That's one of the reasons why you see these soy boys going about. I mean, I can't even pass them by. I gotta like <laughs> stop and let them go by. They're so so hideous. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that that creature, that thing, whatever it is, uh, you know, is is lacking any kind of holistic bioenergy. And their bodies and their gormless faces. They try to grow beards and shit as off, you know, as a parody of the masculine. But yeah. that that uh, sorry, mate, that doesn't cut it. You're still fucking loathsome, right? So the thing is that you know the real male doesn't need to wear the trappings. You know, he doesn't have to wear a t-shirt and drive a pickup truck. To prove he's a, you know or one of these plaid shirts mm. and grow a, a beard, Grizzly Adams, and then you know ride a pickup truck to prove he's male. None of that. He's a different kind of being, uh, uh, but he has masculinity oozing from himself. Mm. And strangely, you see, we have a we have a world in which artisanship, artistry, is also no is is considered no longer part of you know masculinity. So that's one one way I talk about that. There's others as well. Uh, but yeah, the solutions is very, very complex, but it starts with knowing thine enemy. Just as they've studied us, we need to study them. And studying the female psyche, you say, is almost like the spiritual journey. I think I, I, I might have misread that, but it's almost like that is the part, part of the journey, you know, part of the, uh, the, the unraveling. Yeah. Going back to the, see, in another context, more of a Jungian, Newman, shadow work means going back to that Euroboric place to, to face the fears. Some, it's like, remember dismemberment is a mythological motif where the hero gets cut up into thousands of pieces. In the womb, for the one who is born to a terrible mother, you have lost plenty of identity there. You were severed and cut up. Mm -hmm. And so there is a, an incredible journey. Yanov talked about it, Reich, of going back to retrieve pieces of our lost selves. Well, our culture mm -hmm. doesn't deal with psychological disciplines like that. Wilhelm Reich was considered some sort of pervert. You know, Yanov would just forget about him. You know, all of these guys who talked about this, essence of shadow work have been completely silenced and, and uh, lampooned. So my work tries to feature their work to say, no, no, the shadow work is about going back to that Euroboric uh, mm -hmm. cauldron and finding in it, you know, aspects of your lost self. And, you know, this is a great deal of empowerment. It's like going into the underworld as other yeah. cultures would have, would have spoken of it. Yeah. So, so it, it just in practical terms, that means for guys that are listening just to um, being able to just drop back into your bodies again, back into your nervous system. I mean, I, I know that I, I once uh, met a guy, he was, a, he's an energy worker called Shantan Yama. And he said to me, you're stuck in your head. He says, every time that you have some kind of uh, incident in your life that causes distress, you try and solve it in your head, in your mind. And he said, the mind is not there to deal with the problems. You have to get down into your nervous system. It's the nervous system that heals, not the mind. And actually, my, my spiritual journey was to go down into the underworld with that. And it was actually quite a rocky few years because it was almost like the hero's journey, you know, the yeah. hero's journey of facing the, I guess, facing the dragon, like you see in a lot of monomyths, you know. Um, yeah. But the, uh, the elixir, the prize that I gained from that was to, I integrated parts of myself um, that, you know, and I became more embodied as a, as a, as a result of that, which for me was the, uh, you know, it was the returning back to the village, if you like. That's the integration I, I found, you know. And so that was a big a big journey for me to go through that. And I think that's uh, kind of uh, what you're saying with the work is to, to heal that part of yourself and become that, to integrate the, the, the divine, even the divine uh, feminine within the masculine, you know, 
is important yeah. and to, to have that real true empathy but not come from that distorted empathy which is about you know for, for more statism and uh, totalitarian powers you know that kind of thing yeah empathy with your own body Absolutely. and you have to have, you have to have pat yourself on the back and feel good about going and retrieving that stuff you have the right to do it and my goodness the trend it's like opening the aladdin's cave you find yourself what could be more fantastic than that Absolutely. And just, just, I just wanted to mention, I don't know if you've heard of a guy called Lloyd de Maus. He's a psychoanalyst, but he actually coined the term psychohistory. And what he did is he looked into the relationship between child, the childhood of like world leaders and the, their political decisions, if you like, and, and, and the, the, the historical periods that then, um, you know, came after that. Uh, and he actually analyzed periods preceding the outbreaks of war and the upheavals and stuff like that. And he noticed that military leaders were using the language to describe prenatal distress. So he noticed there was a there was a correlation between the language and, and yeah. talking and, and these just pre pre war periods and talking about choking of the, by the enemy, the threat of the whirlpool and it, you know the whirlpool represents you know the, the period just before birth that uh, people people have uh, experienced in sort of regression states, uh, reaching the other side of the tunnel and then you also have uh, Samuel Adams talked about the American Revolution he talked about the child for independence now struggling for birth, the you know the atomic bomb in Hiroshima was was named after the plane was named after the pilot's mother Enola Gay and the mm -hmm. bo and the bomb was called the little boy and it was declared the yeah. baby was born you know so there's a lot of symbolism in terms of this yeah. sort of uh, this birthing we're still but, working it all out that's how all that yeah. symbolism appears in our sort of theater of life is because we're still working out even though we don't know we're working it out yeah absolutely so before before we think, I just want to uh, give you a, a shout out to, to the to, to my audience here so we're talking here about dragon mother a new look at the female psyche I've actually read this book twice cover to cover it's it's an absolutely brilliant book and it's not and what it does Michael you've actually written it in a way that actually um, appeals to both my my left brain and my right brain if you like there's a lot of dense information there but in in many ways it's sort of so some of the some of the language you use is very poetic and you know it's almost like J.R. J.R. Tolkien you know esque um, and it's 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 beautifully written um, and you know you could even just go back into the book and just you know randomly go into various chapters as you would in a sort of finding an interesting article in a newspaper it's a brilliant book absolutely fascinating book you've done a lot of great work you know aggregating all these different psychoanalysts and psychologists and you know you're tying in neuroscience and mythology and you know, philosophy. I just find it's absolutely brilliant book. And uh, if people want to find you, Michael, what's the best way to do it? You've got your website. Is that right? MichaelSarian.com. And is there any, any other way they can uh, find out about you? Oh, yeah. And again, thank you very much, John, for that. But yeah, dragonmother.org, you know, but basically go to MichaelSarian.com because then all the other sites are clearly linked, you know, uh, very, very simply linked. And uh, there's about 14 sites, you see, so it's a devil of a time trying to organize them. But yeah, just go to michaeldesign.com or head over to dragonmother.org. And there's articles there as well, but there's articles even on the Michael Tessarian site, which sort of, you know, harp on some of the similar themes as well. So people can Absolutely. definitely uh, read those and contact me, you know, with ideas and thoughts. Fantastic. So that all that's left to be said is thank you so much, uh, Michael, for coming on the show. And, you know, hopefully one day we can get you back on and, you know, we can go off on another, uh, uh, you know, uh, a big journey into a, another particular theme. So thank you so much, Michael. Thanks for coming on and uh, all the best. Project, mate. Thanks.